Welcome to Pseudopod Towers. Get comfy. Find a cushion to hide behind. You're going to need it. Pseudopod, episode 553, July 28th, 2017. This week's story, Fade to Gold, by Benjamin Sidunkow. Hello everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I'm Alistair, your host, and this week's story was first published in End of the Road, edited by Jonathan Oliver from Solaris Books in 2013. This week's story is written by Benjamin Sridunkow, who writes love letters to the future and beautiful bugs. Her fiction has appeared in Tor.com, Clark's World, and Beneath Ceaseless Skies, amongst others. She blogs at beacon.wordpress.com, which we will of course drop in the show notes, and edits fiction for Harlot Media. Your reader this week is Jen Zink. Jen is a stay-at-home mom and podcaster with a love of all things science fiction and fantasy. You can find her on Twitter at loopdilou, which is L-O-O-P-D-I-L-O-U, or on the Skiffy and Fanti show, which is skiffyandfanti.com. There's lots of Fs and more Ks in there than you might think. We'll make sure the link is in the show notes. Or on Twitter at S-K-I-F-F-Y-A-N-D-F-A-N-T-Y, which she produces and co-hosts. The Skiffy and Fanti Show is a weekly podcast and active blog featuring anything and everything related to the science fiction and fantasy genres, with commentary on controversial topics and news in literature, film, and interviews with authors, scientists, and filmmakers. They do great work. Go check them out. So, we have a story for you, and we promise you, it's true. Fade to Gold by Benjamin Sridwanku They say the afterlife is a wheel, and that is true, but I am between, and so for me the way is the line. It unspools interminably into a horizon that shows the soft gold of dawn, always just a little out of reach. Before the war this was only packed earth and grass and dirt to me. Before the war I trod this path from home to capital, thinking of the sweetness of rare fruits. Now that my back is to a utia, the ground is sometimes baked salt where nothing grows, and sometimes wet mud bubbling with the voices of the dead. Inside my arteries there is blood which throbs and pumps, and my belly growls at emptiness as might a bad-tempered dog. But it is difficult to be sure, after so much soldiering, that one is still alive. It is difficult to be certain that this is not all a fever dream. It can be difficult to remember who you are, having watched Queen Suryotai die. These are the common ailments of any soldier, though few will admit them. A burnt village, a burnt temple. I see such often these days, defaced by the Pama who melted off the gold and stole every metal coin. Sometimes in their savagery they kill the monks, even though theirs and ours wear much the same saffron. The Pama have faces no different than any mother's son, four limbs and a head each, but it strains belief that anything human could have slaughtered holy men. Do they not have long poor like second fathers, who taught them to read and write? Are some of them not orphans taken in by a temple to shelter beneath the steeple in the Bodhi shade? Slaughter is what might have happened here, or else flight, for I find neither a living voice nor a body thick with flies. Everyone fled for a UTA until the walls strained at the seams, until every house and hovel splintered at the edges. It should have been comforting, so many people. But when there was so much desperation, all I could feel was desperation in turn, a sour and unrelenting fear that turned everything I ate 
and even the king's soldiers hadn't much to eat, into rotten meat on the tongue with an aftertaste of cinders. I take shelter where I find it, in spite of ghosts that must have seeped into the fissured walls and the desecrated murals, in spite of knowing that Pama soldiers have been here too, that the air bears the stink of their sweat, the reek of their filth. Being a soldier has taught me to forget delicacy. It has also taught me to put on sleep light as dead petals to be shaken off and scattered at a blink. So when the mud makes sucking noises, I am already awake. When the woman comes into view, I have a hand around the carved wood of a hilt. She must have seen the blade glint, for there is a hiss of breath. I thought you might be a thief, she says. What could a thief rob from a place already thieved to every final clod of dirt? There is always one last bit of painted glass, one last talisman. She closes the distance, her apparent fear set aside. One last child to murder? Have you lost one, then? There's still room in my breast for softness, still room to be cut by another's hurt. It's a season for losing children. The luster of her lips and hair seems brighter than dawn's light warrants. You can only be passing by. Which way calls you? East, to Pratchine Bury. The same direction, then. She gathers her braid in one hand, twisting it. Might we not share company? I have collected myself, spine straight, eyes clear. In the back of my mind, phantom flies buzz. There is no escaping the noise. No battle-hardened veteran ever tells you it is the flies that haunt you most, over the cannon fire and your fellow's screams, over the throb and burn of your own veins. You would trust a strange soldier? When she is a woman, why not? My alarm must have been immediate, for she laughs. Even officers go bare-chested the moment they're free from uniform. You remain as neat behind yours as a captain newly promoted and pledged to his majesty. Her head moves from side to side. I'll not pry. Too much. I want only safety, for if you've survived the Pama, you must be as fit to the business of combat as any man. I should ask how she has been unscathed so far. I should ask from whence she came and where she was going other than in the same vague direction as I am. But in the army I've been solitary out of need, and there comes a point where a person must hear another human voice or break upon the cliff face of loneliness. My secret is already laid bare to her. So where's the harm? We set out at daybreak, keeping parallel to but avoiding the road, for not all soldiers recently unyoked from duty are vessels of honor, and I've heard news of Pama stragglers along this way, ready to avenge themselves upon any tie. She breaks open one of her bamboo tubes as we walk and hands me half the sweet roasted rice. Her name is Ploy, a widow, and when she hears my name is Tita Kesorn, she smirks at the florid grandeur of it. A princess's name, she says. My parents had expectations. Years living with an aunt who married upward, wife of a merchant grown wealthy on trade with the jean. So successful, he sailed to the Middle Kingdom twice, and his fortune tripled by a wife shrewd with numbers and investment. She would tutor me, it was hoped. Instead, you took up the sword. How do I say that I went to the capital to learn to be a lady, and fell in love with the queen despite the hopeless stupidity of that? How do I say it was for this love that I fought, and that when she fell it shattered me? How do I say that I resent the king's continued life, for she was the braver of the two, the finer being, and that he did not deserve a wife as incandescent as she? So I seal my lips, and pronounce none of these wounds." Better they superate than my shame be cast into the day. She may have the secret of my gender, but this is mine alone to nurse. The day brightens, and Ploy acquires a clarity of features. Before I thought her soft and plain, now there is an angle to her eyes and mouth I've failed to notice in the dim, sharp from nose tip to chin tilt. It does not make her beautiful if such a comment may be leveled from someone as blunt-featured as I. But she would snag the attention and hold it fast. A little like the queen. The dead queen, whom I must not think about. 
whom I must bury under the blackest soil of memory. When I shut my eyes, I see elephants draped in black and silver, trumpeting for death. I see the edge of a glaive passing through flesh and bone, opening a queen inside out. Noon claims the sky with fingers bright and fever hot. It is a month for rain, but I harbor a childish fancy that the season has upended for Queen Seriota's demise. Between my waking delirium transmuting earth to a sanguine river and us stopping to drink from a pool, we hear the Pama. Away from the shields bearing the king's crest, away from his banners and helms, it can be difficult to tell Pama deserters from our own men, loincloth and bare-chested like any a Utia soldier, bearing much the same type of blade. There is a wild look to them that I can spot even as we take to hiding, and I wonder if the penalty for desertion is as harsh for them as for us. Harsher. Victors can afford generosity that losers may not. When they are gone, Poloi murmurs, I thought you would challenge them, for are these not your sworn enemies and murderous animals? There were five of them, and one of me. Her sneer is vicious. If I needed confirmation you were a woman before, I would have required none now. What did you lose to the Pama? A family. Her mouth tightens. She says no more. I study her more closely for signs of who she is or might have been. Widow says little. Designates merely a specific sorrow. Strange that we will confess but one loss at a time. I am a widow. I am an orphan. How to say in one concise word, I've lost everything. Evening approaches, and Ploy looks to me, asking of game and hunt. I mean to scavenge and work for food on the way, and point out that the army taught me to ambush enemy warriors, not edible meat. You make an inadequate man, she passes me her satchel. I'll be back. I wait beneath the tabayak whose trunk is garbed in a purple sash. There's not much of worth on me, but I smooth out the cloth as best I can and pour out a handful of rice for offerings. Ploy returns with frogs fat and glistening, her arms wet to the elbows, fa spy and fa noong damp. Tell me you can make a fire. That, at least, I was taught. You must have been very fast, or those frogs very old. And you do not know how to flatter anyone. How are you going to find a husband? By changing out of this into silk and silver. I touch the edge of my helm. By combing out my hair. In truth, I aspire to spinsterhood. For how do I explain the battle scars once all that silk is stripped away? Not evidence that I was wayward as a child. Marks left by a blade resemble in no wise marks left by a switch. I sharpen twigs and skewer her catch. The meat is succulent, and she carries a jar of the best fish sauce I've had in months. I leave two crisp frog's legs by the tabayak's roots, among bruised flowers, for the tree's spirit. The next village is empty, too. I begin to think perhaps all the villages in my path will be unpeopled save by wraiths, that this is beyond death after all, and I'm rotting beneath a fallen war elephant. But I must not think so, for when I do, the trumpeting and the cannon fire gain strength between my ears, and if those are bearable... The buzzing is not. Ploy is as disinclined as I to the sin of theft, and so we limit our looting to two rattan mats and some oil. We find a creaking riverside house and rest on its veranda back to back. I remain awake enough to know she slips away long before dawn. When the sun is up, she comes back with two roosters. It was not a clean kill. Blood everywhere, on her and them their bellies ragged as if they've been chewed to death. She sets them down. A wild dog must have been at them. This time, we've banana leaves to wrap the meat and proper seasoning. Sugar, garlic, coriander root. Afterward, we find a rain jar and a coconut shell dipper. No jasmine water to scent ourselves with, but I've been long crusted in sweat and filth, and Ploy is glad to shed her gore-stained clothes. She looks on, frowning as I disrobe and breathe in relief to have the binding off at last. How did you have those cuts tended without the entire army discovering you have breasts? I had patronage. Her Majesty's handmaids understood so simply a woman's need to be in arms. 
Ploy produces yet another wonder, a pot of tamarind paste and turmeric. She bids me turn my back and spreads that across the width of my shoulder blades, down my spine, in a bright, tart-smelling lather. My breath catches once, and she asks if there's a wound as yet unhealed. It's nothing. There is no way of saying that I've never had another woman's hand on me so, except that of kin. There's no way of saying that her touch pulls the strings of my nerves taut, a note so loud in my skull that for a moment all else is mute. I make myself indifferent while she, nude, washes her clothing. But my eyes stray and my skin craves. Is it any wonder that the monks tell us earthly desire is a shackle? Material lust a disease? Rest comes slow and I am not even drowsing by the time Ploy steals away. I have no appetite, she says when I offer her chicken in the morning. Then she scrubs at her teeth with a koi stick, rinsing her mouth over and over as though she swallowed unutterable foulness. We circle back toward the main road. For a relief, we meet a family. Two grandparents, their daughter and son-in-law, a buffalo pulled cart laden with supplies and children. Ploy takes my arm before I can speak, introducing me as her husband. The breastplate and helm purchase respect and welcome. They share food with us and their spirits are high. Here is a family that went through war untouched by tragedy. I keep my words few, my voice low. I've allowed myself to speak freely with Ploy, and if I never trilled or chirped as some women do, still my natural pitch would have given me away. They would have missed it and I might have two if not for the flies. That sound, I would know it anywhere. Gorge rising, I stride into the bushes. Ploy calls, but she is muted, for black clouds close in about me, red eyes the size of longins, wings larger than open hands. When they disperse and my sight clears, there are the corpses. Pama by the color of their bandanas, a painful death by everything else. Their bellies torn out, and trails wetting the earth, dense with ants and flies, as though they're both sweet and savory. The son-in-law has followed to see what's afoot. This wasn't done by knife or arrow, I say, turning to him. Do you know of any blade that could make wounds so messy? One look at the carcasses, and he recoils. I'm no fighter! Ploy is not far behind him, and when she bears witness to this massacre, she merely says, A tiger this close to the road? Who knows? It is justice. We could cremate them. A waste of oil. She tugs at my hand. Leave them for the worms. Were you born one, you'd have been glad of the gift. I should like to think I haven't been so heinous as to reincarnate so low. But then, I was a soldier. We do not burn the bodies. At a river's crossing, we part company with the family, them turning south while we continue east. Ploy's gaze follows them as they go out of our sight. I wasn't entirely truthful, she says. I don't have a home left to return to. I know. You aren't going to ask why I disappear after dark? You never ask why I became a soldier, or any of the hundred other questions you could have put to me. She looks away but her hand slides into mine. Could there be a place for me in Pratchinebury? There'll be work. I hesitate, this close to pulling my fingers away from hers, but they knit, and there is an easy fit to our hands. My grandmother might want another woman in the household. Toddlers running underfoot. Her gaze lifts, fastens to mine. We could see each other every day, then. My pulse races. It is a terrible affliction to have your heart lurch this way, and that at nothing more than another's glance, another's breath, if you like. What a shame it is you aren't a man. Ploy's smile is only half-edged. The other, perhaps, has turned inward to cut herself. Then I could have married you. You'd have returned garnish with not just a rank, but also a wife. And all this would have been so perfect. There are a hundred breeds of madness, one of them called curiosity. Her naming of it has roused mine, and where before it lay dormant, now it is a frenzied thing, stirring in my skull a thousand wing beats in time with the cicadas and owls singing the moon up through pale clouds. 
a hundred breeds of madness, and I haven't been sane for a long time. I resist it. I look at her face in the light as we draw nearer to home, and become desperate that her taunt was truth, that I was a man, that the possibility she offered in jest could grow to actuality. But in Pratchinebury I may not remain behind this garb. I must step out of it and return to Fa Spy that bears my shoulders, Fa Nung that must have some gleaming thread to it. I must catch a man's eye and hope he will find me worthy of dowry. Employ, being without kin to give her station and place, will remarry. This is only pretense, my hand in hers, and sometimes lying face to face as evening cools and dark comes. It is all make-believe. She wishes I were a man, so I might provide her security in a roof. Beyond that, there is nothing. This terrible knowledge, that this is all we will ever have, it tears at me, it claws. Even the distraction of ghost elephants and ghost queens only I can see proves unequal to it. My monstrous desire eats. My curiosity waxes. Five days from Pratchinebury, and I give in. She makes no secret of leaving my side now. Always it takes the better part of the night, and her outing brings meat more often than not. Perhaps it embarrasses her to be good at the hunt. I convince myself this is her secret, and if so, what injury can come out of my confirming it? Ploy is not difficult to follow. In those first evenings she might have been, when she stole away on light and cautious feet. Now her tracks are clear, as though she's giving me a test of trust. My failing of it pricks at me, and I would have turned back if not for the sight of her prone by the river. She lies among weeds and roots, fainted or snake-bitten. I've never known myself for such quickness. Even on the battlefield, I was not so fast. Mouth parched with fear, I kneel by her, straining to see under a moon just half bright. Bright enough to see her neck empty. Not a wound, but a bloodless hole where her windpipe should have been. I dare not touch her probe, for who knows whether she will feel, but I've learned the fright tales of Krasu at Elder's feet. Cut her open now, and I will find the shell of ploy hollowed of organs. Those have gone with her head. I lack the courage to stay and confront. I lack the courage even to flee, for she knows me, would recognize my scent. Ploy returns empty-handed this time, and I watch her mouth, her teeth, her flecks of gore and shreds of viscera. None to be seen, she may believe me gullible, but she is not entirely careless. The army taught me to put on a mask, and I do that now. The slightest change in my regard and she will realize. I address her much as before. Still some hint must have slipped through, for she asks me why I seem to dread homecoming so. It's been some time since I last saw them and of my parents' dreams for me I failed every one. Were you a son, they would have been proud. She puts her fingers to my jaw. I say this not to taunt or mock you, but to say it is not fair, it is not just. With what you've earned, you should be entitled to anything, and in your place a man would have had applause, honor, his pick of a bride. My betraying body leaps to her touch, Longs to lean into her arm. The world is what it is. The army paid me well, so I'll have something to show for it. Something to give mother and father. In Iutia, they would have me stay on, to advance from captain to lieutenant. And that's what I would have done if Her Majesty survived. I would have been there simply for her, to protect her even if she would never have glanced my way. I would have not been here with this creature, this Krasu. Elder's wisdom has it that they inherit the curse generation to generation. And that may be, it may be true. Ploy could just be the victim of her aunt, uncle, parent. She gobbles up what she must. Chicken's blood. Pama innards. She may be as virtuous a woman as any other. But I cannot bring her to Pranchine Bury. There will be pigs butchered and she'll hunger. There will be women in childbirth and the blood will summon her to consume mother's insides and infant freshly born. So many things a Krasu may not resist. So much evil just one may commit. Ploy's mood grows tense as we approach Pratchinebury, pendulating between elated and anxious. She wants to know if people will be kind to her, a strange widow with no origins. She wants to know if they will disdain her for knowing no letters, 
I tell her nothing and everything. Twice I crouch by her headless body shaking. Twice I fail to kill it and kill her. After tomorrow we should be in Prachanburi. She is combing out her hair. It isn't as long as other women's, and uncharitably I think that she must keep it short so it won't tangle up with her intestines when she goes hunting. Strange, she murmurs. I'll miss this. Sleeping on the ground? Having no roof over your head? Ploy swats me on the arm. I should flinch. I should clench my teeth on disgust. I will miss your company, just being with you, talking to you. We can do that there. That's not what I mean, and you know it. Ploy ties her hair back. I wasn't entirely kidding when I said I would have liked to go as your wife. I doubt I could have kept up this deception for the rest of my days, leastwise before my family. Not what I mean, either. Her brows knit. Oh, she has a way of frowning. Before learning the truth of her nature, that look would have made me do anything to ease it. Do you mean to shame me by driving me to say plainly what no woman should? Wanting. Wanting. That's all flesh is good for. Her hand remains cradling my cheek, and I cannot make myself dislodge it. This close I thought she would smell of awful, but there's only a scent of sweat. Of her. What might that be? She lets her hand fall. My heart falls with it to steep and ferment in the bitterness of my stomach. Nothing. It was only a fancy. It had profited us both to forget. If you like. I say easily, as though none of this has meaning. I remain at her insensate shell longer that night. I've heard a Cressu's glow as sickly and jaundice, but what I see is soft candlelight amber. Innards drift behind her as though the tails of a kite. Even having seen that, my decision congeals slow, like blood thinned by lymph. Even having seen that, I cannot think a Crassu in Pratchine Bury, and me its harbinger. She might have children there, and one of them will receive her legacy whether or not they wish, whether or not she wishes. It may be mercy as well as defense. So I gather wood, as dry as may be found in this weather, until I have more than I need. I gather dead leaves, though some are so damp they are nearly mulch. I moor my thoughts to the pier of Pratchine Bury. I think of what I will eat there, sweet and sour things, and of greeting friends long unseen. Above the sky lightens. The lamp oil ploy and I collected is spent to the last drop. My hands are guided not by thought, but by the reflexive process of fire-making, of burying her in branches and detritus, a mound of compost. It all crackles. Fire is a sound. It all leaps. Fire is an animal. It bursts with smells all pungent. Fire is a feast. It brings her, as I knew it must. I stand with feet braced and blade bared. Heart and lungs, liver and intestines, limbed in that exquisite golden light, the same precise hue of dawn. I would say she is unhuman, but are those not the most human parts of anyone freed from skin? while I hide myself behind the artifice of fabric and armor? Ploy's face remains her own. There is no bestial rictus that reveals her for what she is. There is only a gaze piercing me like arrows. There is only a mouth parting around words like knives. I desired you, she says, and her voice is not the hag's croak that I was told would emerge from a crassu's mouth. I wanted to be with you. And there'd have been no children. I would have been the last. You would have killed and eaten. My muscles tremble. My throat is shut and my breath comes fast. Wild animals, pigs, invaders. Her laughter rings pure and clear while her guts undulate, eelish and glistening. <laughs> I've long learned control, Tita Kesorn. The Pama cut my nieces apart. There will be no more of us. This would have been the end. A Krasu would say this. My voice splinters. Beside us the fire grows loud, hungry, the heat and brilliance of it bringing sweat and radiance to us both. A Krasu would say anything to escape death. A Krasu who wants survival would not give you her trust. A Krasu who courts life would kill one who's murdered her. Tears on her cheeks. 
salt on my tongue. I despise you. I kick apart the pyre, plunge my hands into the flames. It is too late. It has always been too late. Beneath the kindling, she is limbs gone to roast, flesh gone to broil, her breast bared and red raw. Pressing blistered hands to my face, I scream, and it's hardly a human sound. She presses her mouth to my temple, and her guts move against me, coolly wet. I expect them to seek my neck and cord into a noose, but they slide across my shoulders and arms until I understand this is her last remaining means of comfort. I despise you, she whispers. I love you. We are no kin. Her spit will not force her fate upon me. But she could still bite, could still kill. I wrap my arms around her, around a heart that pumps so strong it jolts my bones. My face and her hair, and her lips at my ear. She tells me of how an aunt died when she was eleven, and passed her this inheritance. Four years later, she became mistress of the hunger. Four years later, she began to dream that she may not have to be her aunt, may live like any other girl save for her forays in the dark. In a prosperous place, a prosperous time, she could fill her belly full by the day, and so need not venture forth every night. I do not speak. This is her time to be heard. Her words come slower as the sun climbs higher, even though I keep us in the shade and shield her from the day. Her eyelids droop heavy, and her head lowers to my shoulder as if to doze off. She crumbles in my arms. It seems unthinkable that she could turn from flesh to husk in a moment. It seems unthinkable that her face should collapse upon itself, her hair drying to twigs, her lips and eyes to sun-baked fruit. She is dust. The buzzing of flies grows in my head, and I turn to the rising sun toward home. My arms are full of her, dry flecks collecting in the creases of my clothes and skin. In the distance, I hear war drums. The horizon shines gold with the beginning of fire. There will be pigs butchered and she'll hunger. There will be women in childbirth and the blood will summon her to consume mother's insides and infant freshly born. Walk around this story and from any angle you see wells of horror that descend from the geographic and political into the deep, silent depths of the personal. The horror here isn't monstrous. It isn't the familiar idea of something wearing a human face. It's so much more, so much wider and so much more in depth than that. There is the horror of war and its aftermath, the horror of what war does and what war makes those who survive it do. There is the horror of vengeance as the last destination anyone will ever travel to, the horror of the world scoured clean, but, as is said early on, never fully, and that dreadful quiet that comes between the end of the first and the start of the next. The horror of wondering who will fill the gaps we have gouged into ourselves. The horror of wondering whether that process is done or ever will be. The horror of expectation. Of the gender roles that the characters are forced to hide behind. The horror of finding the only space you can define as your own, having boundaries set by other people. Of trying to be your own person inside a box that has been built around you by committee. The horror that comes with that, of restriction, of resentment, the horror of desperation, the horror of hope, and the horror of love. Not of the emotion itself, but of the surrender of control, of self when identity is both currency and passport. The moment of weary, bloodied heroism quoted above, the realisation that in order to save someone, you are going to have to stop them. The realisation that the roles you have been forced to play have left more of a mark on you and the people who matter to you than you expected or wanted. The realisation that you have held the line. You have survived, but you have not done so unscathed, and you are never going to. 
the horror of realizing that the way is a line and that line is one you will be walking for a long time to come. For supporting our Kickstarter, we'd like to give a very special thank you to Darren and his dog, Okroma. She's a miniature American Eskimo, and for ten plus years they've walked around the same park listening to Pseudopod. So, if you see a guy walking a little white fluffy dog, you never know. He might be listening to a horror story. Thank you both. We rely on you to pay our authors and cover our server costs. To do that, you have three options. The first two involve going to pseudopod.org and clicking on Feed the Pod. There you can either donate or subscribe for great justice, or for five bucks a month, whichever works. Alternately, we have a Patreon now. Go check out the show notes and pledge and get some great free stuff from us. We will be back next week with A Doll Full of Nails, written by Ville Miralainen and read by Riku Kaninen. Then, as now, will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. We'll see you next week.